This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com. This show is brought to you by IndieWrestling.us. Check out IWC, RWA, and more. And listeners like you, support this show at patreon.com slash wrestling mayhem show. Hey guys, it is the Indie Mayhem Show. I'm Mike Sorg at Sorgatron on the Twitter here in the Sorgatron Media Studios here in Pittsburgh, PA. Alone, of course, physically. Uh, actually, that's not true. Producer Missy's hanging out in the back, but uh, we're, we're, we're just quarantined together, so it's all good. Uh, but with us, um, and, and actually the first time I think I've had this this, this gentleman remotely, because every time this, he's, he's insisted on being on in the studio or in person the few times that we've uh, interviewed him on this show and Wrestling Mayhem show. Uh, back with us, uh, because he's got a project that I hope you guys are going to check out. I'm, I'm carving out some time to make sure I watch this when this releases here in a day. Magnum CK on the line with us. How you doing, man? Uh, I'm doing well, considering all the circumstances. But, you know, the main reason I like to come to your studio is not just for the live energy, but because... Uh, first time guests always get that tote bag full of, uh, souvenirs and I keep trying to act like I never got one before. So I see how many I can get. Yeah. 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 We have that problem. Yeah. It involves, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, coupons for the taco stand, uh, slice on Broadway and, uh, and a me bobblehead apparently. Uh, yeah, so, the, yeah, the the Sorg the Sorgatron Media bathrobe is my personal favorite. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, we we were just talking about beforehand. We I think we talked with you shortly before your retirement. So what have you been doing with your non wrestling time? Uh, I've just been uh, staring at the wall. And okay. Sometimes, sometimes the ceiling. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, uh, up until you know this quarantine thing really grounded i mean everybody but i really uh it took it was a wild adjustment because I, I i'm pretty much non-stop i think after leaving active wrestling um i kind of overcorrected, and i think my therapist would probably agree that i probably overdid it <laughs> with a bunch of other things mm -hmm. and uh I, by the end of it you know three or four months after i left wrestling I had like four jobs and like was doing all these shows and stuff. So this quarantine has been a good reset button because I'm like, oh, yeah, this is I, this is my house. I can unpack. We've only lived here for like two years. <laughs> oh, very, very familiar with that. Uh, it, it is actually kind of funny because I, I just watched the uh, Edge documentary that WWE just put out. And it, it sounds it. it sounds like the, have you have you watched that yet. Yeah, I loved it. I, yeah. Uh, it, it sounds like the same thing because he just kind of like said, OK, what's the next thing and rolled into and, and very because I know you have you know the bug and you're very involved in, in acting uh, as well. So it, that had been re very relatable for you. Well, yeah, absolutely. And, and one thing that made me laugh about that documentary was um, when Edge, I think he did an interview like two or three weeks or whatever it was after he retired and. He was talking about doing some auditions and he's like, yeah, but I'm not, I'm not an actor, you know, I'm not going to go out and be an actor and do all these things. And then the next knew he's in like every show and booking all these jobs. <laughs> and I laughed because I can relate to that because it's like, yeah, you know, I'm going to take some time. And then a week later, I'm like overcommitted and I'm late for appointments and I'm running behind for meetings because <laughs> I've <laughs> done too much. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a good point, though, too, because even like this documentary, like you said, is coming out tomorrow. Um, I was, I was, we were taking our dogs, my wife and I were taking our dogs on a walk, uh, which is basically all we get to do now. And, uh, and I was telling her, I, she was like, man, tomorrow's your birthday and the movie's coming out. Like, are you excited? And I was like, I forgot about it. Like, I know I've been editing it, working on it, promoting it, doing all that stuff. But I was like, oh yeah, because in my mind it's done and it's, it's out there now. And what now? What's next? Mm -hmm. And I can relate to that feeling. So last time we had you on, because I, I, I had discovered Marking Out, uh, your first documentary, and then later connecting the dots after meeting him, like, oh, wait, that's you. <laughs> and oh, wait, your friend is that t-shirt guy in that. Yeah. So so from what I understand, what, this was supposed to be kind of a, 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 a spiritual or direct sequel to, to Marking Out. I, I, I believe early discussion, this was kind of referred to as a Marking Out too. That was the plan. And, you know, you, you hit on something else, which is I have this strange like chameleon like person like uh, physical personality where if i grow a beard people are like oh i didn't even recognize you or if like a couple years go by and i've dropped 20 pounds or something it looks like a different guy so that happens a lot where people have seen mm. marking out 
And then they're like, I, it took me like three years to realize that you were that guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So this movie, we were, you know, Mike Rhodes and I made, we made that movie and we made uh, Magnum's Opus. But uh, originally it was supposed to be uh, marking out to with the tentative tagline or the uh, subtitle of uh, Magnum's Opus, just because we thought it was a, a, a neat little title. And I was just going to be a part of it, like a small part of it, really. I mean, it was going to be like, hey, remember we did this? fun quirky documentary about wrestling well chris went back to wrestling and hey let's look at him and he's an aiw tag champion now that's fun and then we were going to follow all kinds of other people and i was just going to be like a small part and then i got really popular in cleveland and then the whole injury thing happened and it was mike who was actually like you know we're making a different movie now (laughs) you know because all this stuff just happened out of nowhere and um we have so much footage from other things that just didn't really fit into this project anymore that we could easily use, you know, to release online in the future or for another project altogether. So we just mm-hmm. had to roll with it. We had to, we had to yes. And the situation. <laughs> and if you're on visuals with us, that was a little bit of images from the marking out uh, trailer, which actually is available. If you have Amazon prime and that's where I discovered it too, because it was one of those things I found one night and then I'm like messaging Joe Dabrowski. I'm like, do you realize you're on this documentary? <laughs> you know, things like that. Like his commentary from, I believe the remix shows that are a part of that. Uh, you know, things like that. It's just kind of like a weird discovery. You know, you, you know, seeing like people you work with in other projects, uh, kind of thing happening there. Uh, so that is freely available. If you guys can go check that out there, and I'm sure on out, other outlets as well, right? Uh, marking out, yeah, yes. it's, uh, marking out is uh, we have uh, physical media and it's on Amazon Prime. Yeah, mm-hmm. excellent. Uh, so tell so tell me so tell me about that transition a little bit into you know this being more of what it's become for for this documentary. It was a, I don't know, it was a weird time because a lot was happening. Um, You'll find out a lot more detail in the documentary, but, you know, I was injured. I had a back injury for for a year, almost a a little over a year, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was just in pain for a long time and it kept getting worse and worse, but we just kept trucking along. I was still acting and directing. I was still doing, you know, uh, finishing another degree that I was working on and, wrestling every weekend i was wrestling in you know new jersey toronto pittsburgh cleveland like all all over the place all the time um and we're just also working on this documentary and it just kind of all changed in about a week's time it was like oh i have this major thing and then you know it was like well what do we do and so we just kept kind of filming kept shooting what we could shoot and um luckily we did because we ended up with a ton of footage but it was a hard decision because you know, we had this whole idea for a movie and it kind of went another direction. Um, I always say, and, and I'm sure I heard this somewhere else because I, I don't remember where if I did, but a documentary is essentially a movie that you write after you filmed it, right? <laughs> after you shot it. <laughs> so you, you, you have a plan and you think, okay, here's the story or here's what we think the story might be. Then you shoot it all. And then you're like, well, that didn't work, but we have all this. Okay, let's put it together. So it just kind of ended up being, you have to really roll with it to mm-hmm. be a, doc, in my opinion, to be a documentary filmmaker. Uh, and, and I don't know that I'll make a documentary again for a very long time just because uh, it's, it's a different animal. It's a different beast. It's much mm-hmm. more difficult, I feel like, because it's a wild medium. You don't have control. Like there are some sections of this documentary where, you know, you're at wrestling shows and stuff and there's not much you can do about the sound, you know, you can only control oh, yeah. so much of the sound. So that drives me as a sound person. I'm a, I'm a radio and sound person. It drives me crazy. And I can't tell you how many dozens of hours I spent trying to get it all perfect. And it was just like, you have to be like, what that scene is what it is. We're at a wrestling show. I don't, you know. <laughs> We're going to throw some titles in there and, and just subtitles yeah. in there and just move ahead. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Excellent. So, so, and this is, and it's kind of interesting because, you know, between, you know, the original marking out was kind of you, if I recall, like rediscovering kind of wrestling, right? And now this is kind of like puts, I don't want to say a bookend on that, but it kind of shows like the beginning and and end of that, at least section of your career, right? Yeah, that's a good way to put it, actually. So we had a question that we put forward uh, in marking out, which was kind of like, why do we all like this wrestling thing? And mm-hmm. then it kind of went into, 
well, why does anyone like anything, you know, like, like, uh, that you're not supposed to like anymore, like comic books or whatever, which I also happen to like, but we went to comic book conventions and, or, or cons or whatever they're called now, and just talked to people who were giant fans of things and just got to the bottom of, or tried to get to the bottom of, uh, the kind of rhetorical question of like, why do you still watch? Why mm -hmm. do you still like this? And, uh, it was a really fun process. I think we learned a lot about just ourselves. Um, and it's funny because like 20, 25 minutes into that documentary, I just out of nowhere, I'm like, oh, yeah, well, I used to be a wrestler. And it's kind of like, what? This guy, did? <laughs> he was a wrestler? <laughs> like, I never thought that that would be a weird kind of like brick thrown into the middle of everything uh, until other people pointed it out that they were like, we couldn't understand why you didn't bring that up sooner. And it was going to all those Chikara shows uh, all over PA and um, just getting back in the locker room and just being around, you know, uh, uh, the roar of the grease paint and the smell of the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of made me think like, man, you know, that kind of lit that fire. And I, and I talk about it in this new documentary a lot extensively. My wife talks about it where I just kept talking about wrestling and she was like, well, why don't you just go try it again? And, and, and I didn't, I was like, yeah, but it's, you know, even though we just made this documentary that pretty much ended on the note of like, hey, it's okay to like wrestling. It's okay to like comics. You know, when I would say, I, I you know, I, I really miss wrestling and, and she'd be like, well, go do it. I would still be like, yeah, but come on. Like, I'm an adult now. I'm like, I'm almost 30. Like, it's wrestling. And she's like, so? Well, you know, why not? And I didn't have a good reason. She's like, it's just like theater. And I'm like, what? Because I a thought, and maybe this is just like, because maybe wrestling fans and even some wrestlers have like a low self-esteem <laughs> problem. I thought, well, you shouldn't be proud to be a wrestler. And, and, and when I wrestled originally, like in 2004 to about 2009, I kind of hid it from a lot of people. I didn't, mm -hmm. that's why I wrestled under, I, I didn't use my real name, you know, and stuff like that. I thought like, yeah, it's not something like, I don't want to be embarrassed or have people ask me like, cause you always get the questions like, oh, you're a pro wrestler. Oh, do you know the rock? Do you guys really use ketchup for blood? You know, like, so like that. and uh, which yes and yes, of course. Um, <laughs> but she kind of because she's not a, my wife's not a wrestling fan at all, and she was like, I don't think any less of someone if they're a pro wrestler. And it kind of made me realize, like, oh, that's all in my head. I, I built that up in my head. That's not a real thing. Mm -hmm. And I just went back and did it. <laughs> and, and to great effect, I mean, I, I you know, definitely one of the, one of the most uh, creative and prolific I, I, I had seen around. It was always kind of like, what, you know, what's Magnum done lately? Uh, yeah, what do the, you do now? Yeah, to the point. Yeah, it was like, <laughs> what, what the heck is Magnum doing in Cleveland with Papa Shango right now? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know. That was great because that night was crazy mm -hmm. because uh, it was February or March of 2018. John Thorne had pneumonia. You know, it was after WrestleMania, so mm -hmm. it must have been April. John Thorne had pneumonia, the promoter, and was like in the hospital and like hooked up to a ventilator or something. So I'm like visiting him before the show and everything's up in the air. And it's just chaos. And we're worried about John. And I actually wasn't booked on a match that night, which was weird because, you know, usually I had a match or something, but the card was stacked. And so I show up and I think I'm just doing a run in. They're like, we really want you to do a segment with Papa Shango. <laughs> so I was like, okay, all right. So on my way into the building, I stopped and bought this black, um, uh, food coloring. And a jar of molasses. Because I thought, because they said, you're doing a segment with Papa Shango. And so I thought, well, goddamn, pal. You got to get that voodoo ooze, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and so I'm like, so I try some of the molasses in the parking lot. And it is disgusting. And I'm like trying to put it in this little balloon. I'm like, if I just pop it in, like, because I saw that that's how Muda and some of those guys did the, uh, their uh, mist, they would mm -hmm. either put it in a capsule or sometimes a, a, a condom of all things, mm -hmm. and they pop it in their mouth, you know. And uh, I wasn't going to use a condom. <laughs> I don't know how to explain that purchase: black dye, molasses, and condoms. <laughs> it's just a Saturday night in Cleveland. Just don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, in Cleveland, right? <laughs> It'd be suspicious if you didn't add condoms to your weird order. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so I get out of my car. And I grab the bag, the shopping bag, the jar of molasses falls out of the bag and shatters on the ground. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't get the voodoo ooze. This whole thing is ruined. 
And when I got to the back, Frankie Flynn was like, hey, I found these black uh, blood capsules. I only got three of them. You think we could use them? And I was like, yes, give me one of them. And uh, Papa Shango was the coolest guy. So, like, he, he did the first half of the show as the Godfather. Mm-hmm. I don't want to smarten anybody up. I don't want to. I don't want to spoil it for anybody. But it's the same guy, and uh, uh, so at intermission, I'm supposed to find Papa Shango and talk out our segment. I'm like, oh, this is cool. Like I'm kind of. I'm not nervous, but I'm like giddy because I'm like, oh my god. Like first of all, I love wrestling and I love to wrestle. But if you have a night off where you're just doing a segment, you're never more relaxed. Cause it's like, I don't have to worry about remembering anything. Like I can just go do a promo. Like, Oh, so I'm having a great night. And so I'm like, all right, well, where's Papa Shango? Like, we think he went to the bathroom to do his makeup. So I walk in and he's standing in front of the mirror and he's just putting on the, 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 you know, the classic Papa Shango white makeup. And it's like one of those things where he sees me, I see him. And it's like, I don't know what to do. Cause I'm like, it's 1992 again in my mind. So I'm like, <laughs> Hey, Papa Shango, <laughs> and he's like, "Hey man, how's it going?" I'm like, Are "You ready to talk out our segment?" And I'm like, "I can't believe this is happening," you know. And then he's just like, "Yeah, whatever you want to do." Uh, he's a super nice guy, and he's like, "I'll say, you know, Balog Day," and then you just act like, you know, you got voodooed, and that was it. I was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Amazing. And I got all this international like press, like, and I got like articles written about me because of it. Like, it was it was wild. It was fun. <laughs> that's awesome I, I know you were doing a game show thing uh uh here in the area for the rise with Lewis nerve we we're actually just talking about it briefly because he I, I don't know if you know he just uh uh, wa- uh lost a loser leaves a rise match and he's heading out to indiana uh so uh, and you were a big part of that uh going on there and i think i think one of the fans got involved bradley uh for a moment yeah <laughs> so. Yeah, he tried to win the game. He tried and failed. But uh, you know, so I had all these ideas. Yeah. Uh, my whole thing is always to try to go a, a different direction from everybody else, and sometimes that's good, and sometimes that's bad. But I've always liked seventies game shows, and I was like, well, how funny would it be just to have this game show wheel and turn it into a whole thing? And uh, uh, really, where the idea came from was a guy, one of the maintenance guys where my wife works, used to come to some of the local wrestling shows, and he made a big, like a custom game show wheel for like something they have it where, where he works and he just made me one for free. And he's like, you know, and so we just made the whole thing and I was like, why not? No one's doing a game show wheel that I know of. And it was fun. I mean, I, you know, it ended up being pretty cumbersome to carry around, but, uh, and you know, a few months after that is when I wasn't, uh, you know, wrestling, but, uh, I still have it. I just moved it around, uh, in my basement and it's still here. And, and that's the whole thing is just trying to do something to be different. And I know it annoyed a lot of people, like not just in the crowd, but like all my weird ideas until, until people trust you. And like, and this happened at AIW, I was very timid at the beginning. And then I started to get more confident and started to believe in myself a little more. And then I would throw out my wild ideas and at first, people were like, oh, man, I don't know. But then once they see that you're over and that it's getting over, then you can pitch anything and get away with it. And sometimes that's even more trouble. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So so tell me about, you know, through this process, you know, uh, documentary filmmaking, I've done a little bit myself. It's a lot of kind of pouring over a lot of material and kind of and, and, and it seems like sometimes rediscovering what you have with it well as you went back over and started to construct this thing was there any threads to this uh you know as you don't want to spoil uh that you found in this uh, that, that really kind of surprised you yeah well i mean first of all just gathering all the footage which you were very gracious and you know giving me some of the footage of, of myself and uh just gathering it and then going through it and cataloging it after i collected it i mean mm-hmm. that was probably 40 or 50 hours just right there. I mean, mm-hmm. just getting everything together. And I think, um, just of wrestling footage, I ended up with about 200 and 250 gigabyte worth of just, just wrestling stuff from the past, you know, 15 years or whatever. And, uh, and that's what I could find. And then, uh, we shot, uh, just to use the same measurement. It was about the same that we shot. So about 500 gigabytes of footage that I'm trying to go through and handle and log. And I have big spreadsheets full, <laughs> full of like, <laughs> the weirdest tags because it'll say the match the date the file name and then have time codes like uh you know like 
uh, two hours and 17 minutes, you know, voodooed by Papa Shango. And then, like, the next show is, like, you know, at one hour, 59 minutes, thrown by my nipples by Swoggle. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, someday when I'm gone and someone's going through my stuff, they're going to be like, this guy's, like, an insane person. <laughs> like, what are all these these Excel spreadsheets for? <laughs> um, so I got to do something pretty cool, which is not only collect all of my uh, wrestling footage, but kind of watch it objectively because we're always our own worst critics. Or I think if you want to be good at stuff, you're probably your, your own worst critic. Um, so just under, under normal circumstances, I would never really watch my own matches. Now I, I would make myself from time to time just to see what something looked like to see like, Oh, that was terrible. Don't do that again. Or how can I make that better? But uh, I never really enjoy watching myself. So I want, I tried to watch, myself from a filmmaker's perspective and i really found myself appreciating uh some of the stuff i did a lot more instead of being like oh i could have done more or what was that or that was rushed or geez what was i thinking it was more like oh that's i forgot about that that's actually pretty clever and i can look at it from an outsider's perspective but it's weird and i was talking about this the other day it's like it changed my memory a little bit because like my last match uh, at AIW was this amazing night, five, 600 fans, you know, standing ovations, just a surreal night. And my whole final entrance was this crazy memory I have where I just tried to stop and soak it all in, but it was like overwhelming. But I've watched the footage so much that when I think back to try to remember that, I just see the footage, which is maybe good, maybe bad, but I, I, I mean, it's more vivid now, but I feel like a lot of my memories of stuff have been replaced with, you know, uh, file footage, uh, but uh, at least I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it. It kind of adds a new layer on that memory, right? Yeah. Well, you know, and it's funny because this project gave me great anxiety for a lot of reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, not the least of which I, I always have a, I have a catastrophizing anxiety, which is when I start to get nervous about something, I start rolling through worst case scenarios all the time and i have a set obsessive compulsive disorder so those worst case scenarios keep going and going and going and going until i either talk myself out of it or now i have a new tactic that really works for me which is write it down write it down get it out of your brain and it really i have journals that i carry with me and if i find myself getting in a thought loop write it down sometimes i'll write it a few times and that's the ocd a little bit mm-hmm. but then i get it out and i'm like there it is it's not in here anymore it's down great um, and I do the same if I have an idea for something. Instead of thinking about it too much and losing it, I'll write it down, which is always the best when you go to bed. Because if you lay in bed, you'll have the best ideas right before you fall asleep. Mm-hmm. And then you don't have a notepad or your phone around. So then you spend 20 minutes trying to talk yourself out of it. Like, it's not that good of an idea. Like, nah, yeah. <laughs> you don't have to get up and go get your notebook. That's not that funny. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so I had this anxiety about this project because I thought, well, it's not going to get done or it's not going to come together and, you know and i and i was talking to my therapist about it and she was like well it's because not only obviously this is important to you and you love wrestling more than probably almost anything i mean theater and wrestling as far as activities are like my life my whole life for the last you know wrestling's been a part of my life since i was zero years old and i've been in theater for 18 years mm-hmm. so performing is everything to me and um she was like you're wound up about this movie because this is your legacy project and you don't, you don't realize that this is your legacy. You're trying to put together what you did into a nice little package and just have it kind of out there in the archives of the world forever. And you're taking it seriously. And that's when it all kind of snapped into focus. And I was like, that's right. Okay. I need to look at this from a third person's perspective and be like, I'm chronicling this guy. What did he do? How did he do it? What's important? cut this, cut this, cut this, you know, piece it together. And that helped that streamlined the whole project. Excellent. Excellent. So Magnum's Opus, it is going to be released uh, tomorrow. We're talking about April 9th here, uh, your birthday, happy pre-birthday. <laughs> so uh, tell people, how can people um, um, catch this thing? Well, uh, it'll be on YouTube at noon, Mm -hmm. um, and it will be on Amazon Prime. Now, Amazon Prime's having some delays Mm -hmm. uh, with some of their titles because of, uh, you know, short staffing issues with COVID-19 and everything. So um, it's still scheduled to be up tomorrow on Amazon Prime. It might get delayed a couple of days. That's entirely possible. But either way, it will be on YouTube uh, uh, tomorrow um, uh, at noon on the dot. It'll pop right up. Nice, nice. Go check that out. 
Um, and uh, anything else? Anything else going on? You need a plug, or uh, uh, just uh, this is probably just an all-encompassing thing for you right now. <laughs> yeah, it is. It doesn't. It, I mean, it, it, it was a big project, uh, and it's a couple of years in the making. Um, the best, if if you if you have trouble finding it or whatever, you know, my Twitter is probably the best place to find the links mm-hmm. um, at the Magnum CK. But um, when you, if you find it on YouTube, I'd love it if people subscribe because we have a lot of more videos, especially now that we're all stuck at home. Uh, we have some videos coming out, not only with some of the extra footage that we have, and I shouldn't even say extra footage like, oh, this wasn't good enough for the film. It's just like, listen, we can't make a four-hour movie. <laughs> like, it's not, it's not the Godfather <laughs> epic. Nobody cares that much, right? So um, I'll be releasing that periodically. So if you hop on YouTube, uh, just go ahead and subscribe, and you'll you'll get some of that stuff because we have some great stuff in the movie with Swaggle and RJ City and uh, tons of Eric Ryan pops up in it, and tons of people pop up in it from the indie scene that you recognize. There's footage from not only AIW and Remix Pro Wrestling, but IWC up your way. Uh, lots of footage there. My mm-hmm. my my nine second spectacular with Shane in your face. <laughs> 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 I, and I was I think I was told by the promoter that was the match where he was sold on you <laughs> yeah, because so the before the show uh the ring broke yes and so they're running late and Shane and I were first match and we had like eight to ten curtain to curtain right mm-hmm. but the show starts like 50 minutes late or an hour late and they're like listen we can give you three minutes. And I could tell Plummer was so heartbroken because he knows that, you know, that no one wants to go up to a restaurant and say, sorry, you have three minutes curtain to curtain. And he's like, could you maybe do a jump start and just get your stuff in in three? And I was like, I have a better idea. What if I do my whole big dumb entrance? Big, long, minute and a half, two minute entrance. Get in the ring, take my time, turn around, bell rings, bang, knee to the face, one, two, three, flash, UFC finish sail to the back, fall around, whatever. And he was like, oh, and I think he was trying to protect me. He's like, that's going to, I don't know if it's going to work for you, man. Like, that's going to look, make you look bad or whatever. I was like, no, no, trust me, trust me. I will not look bad. <laughs> and then I crawled to the back and, and Plummer was the first person to come up to me. He was like, you were right. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, I, that, that's always great to hear. It's better mm. than the alternative. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And of course, Shane in your face, now known as the violent gentleman. Uh, by for anybody looking for him, the the, the look that up. So, uh, awesome, well, Magnum. Always a great to have a have a conversation with you. Oh, my pleasure. Anytime. We don't have to talk about me. Uh, we can talk about Sid Vicious or anything. <laughs> anything else? <laughs> well, we've been doing these. We, 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 we've been doing these. Uh, these these calls where it's just we're catching up with people to see how they're coping for this show. So you're actually a rare interview that we're doing during this time period. So uh, I'll I'll let you know one of the times. Maybe you can pop in if you're not if you're not busy. Yeah, and just not to spoil it, but I've been coping by watching Sid Vicious matches. So perfect, perfect. Because it could be worse. <laughs> hey, there's plenty of back catalog to catch up on, right? Or revisit, or whatever the case may be. Or if that's not your case, hey, Total Bell has just started again. So there you go. You know, <laughs> Brazoodle, Brazoodle. <laughs> Thank you so much, The Magnum CK on the Twitter. Go. I, I, I I'm re-remembering to put the the in front of it because I haven't tagged one of his matches in so long. But uh, go check it out. Check out the documentary. Like I said, I've carved out some time tomorrow so I can go check it out myself uh, as soon as it drops there on YouTube. And uh, and uh, please uh, support support indie wrestling in this time. Uh, we have a page over at indiewrestling.us with uh, 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 several wrestlers and uh, tagging their pa- their Patreon pages, their pro wrestling tees, whatever the case may be. Uh, a lot of the friends of the network. And we're gonna go double check. I'm not sure if it's on there yet, but Magnum CKs will be on there here uh, by the end of the day here. So um, thank you so much, and uh, please support them. Please. Support for independent filmmaking as well. We'll see you guys next time. For the taste of the poor, huh? Sick, 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 you know how I act now. When you got a problem, come and see if I'm a back down. Act wild. Steady sipping check. This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.